Thank you, Adam. And uh, thank you all uh, for being here this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, depending on your time zone. It's my honor to be here with all of you. I have spent the last few weeks reading and absorbing the wisdom from Steve's new book, Peace in the Age of Chaos, The Best Solutions for a Sustainable Future. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to ask both Steve and Des a few questions that expand our thinking and discussion through the lens of advancing positive peace. For those who may not yet have had the pleasure of reading the book, I'd like to open with a question first to you, Steve. What is positive peace and how may this differ from more widely held definitions of peace? Well, Elizabeth, there are many different definitions of peace. But the, and that depends on the utility with which you want to do with peace. So for Global Peace Index, for example, we use the absence of violence or fear of violence. That's a definition most people can agree with. And you can also get constructive measures. Now, if we come back to positive peace, we use the definition of the attitudes, institutions, and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. And what's important is how we arrive at positive peace and then what positive peace is also associated with. So the way we arrive at positive peace is we take the global peace index. It covers about 99.7% of the world's population. We've got it, it goes back 15 years. So it's a solid statistical base. We've got 50,000 different data sets, indexes, and attitudinal survey results. And then we do statistical analysis and mathematical modeling against that to come up with the factors which are most closely associated with peace and also the inverse. We then use other statistical uh, methods to clump them together. We arrive at an eight part topology, which we call the pillars of positive peace. What we can do then now is we can then turn that around and create another index. And we call that the positive peace index. And that's truly profound because now you've got the ability to understand whether the velocity of countries, whether they're improving or deteriorating. And they operate as systems, so it gives you insight into the dynamics of the system. But also, I guess what really blew me away when we'd done this, so we started at peace and ended up with positive peace. But what we found then is that the same factors which create highly peaceful societies, positive peace, also the same factors which create a whole lot of other things which we think are important, like higher per capita income, uh, better measures on well-being and happiness, better performance on the on ecology, better performance on measures of inclusion, and a whole range of other things as well. So therefore, we say that positive peace in many ways creates an optimal environment in which human potential can flourish. Fantastic. So with that as a backdrop, um, I will dive into some tougher questions here. Um, and for both of you, um, I have a two-part question about the greatest power competition. As the US, China, and Russia compete for global influence and power, how might the leaders of these nations be encouraged to use the positive peace framework as a way of achieving foreign policy and national security goals, shifting away from a reliance on violence, coercion, and the demonstration of force? And part two, given its position in the Global Peace Index, how might Europe be a leader in this transition? So who would you like to uh, yes, what, do you, what do you think? I feel that was going to be your choice, uh, Elizabeth. Um, it's much easier for me to uh, play off Steve's uh, answer to that question, but I have a goal. Okay, can I just say at the beginning, though, you know, I mean, I've known Steve for, uh, well, first of all, I should say thank you to, to the ELN for, uh, and others for uh, putting this uh, interesting um interesting event on and for all of you for uh, various times in the day uh, engaging in it. Uh, so I've known Steve for 10 years approximately and we've become real friends. Uh, so I just I just want to say at the beginning, I mean, although I am, you know, a student of the Killerley Academy of Positive Peace, I'm not a graduate yet and I'm still learning, but 
the, th the thing that is most attractive to me about what Steve does is that he gives me the data um, to support my prejudices, you know, informed by the experience I've had in public policy terms, you know, including the time I was a Secretary of State for Defence, but otherwise. But my principal prejudice is reflected in the long title of his book. Um, which is Peace and Chaos, the best solution for a sustainable future. I am utterly convinced that the only sustainable peace is a peace that is based on common interests and international leadership. And that, you know, these are, there are some very strong messages in Steve's philosophy and in his experience and his analysis of all the data. He is the absolute master of data. Um, and, and the strongest of them, in my view, is that peace is more than security, at least the modern definition of security. Peace is more than security and it requires leadership. So it seems to me the answer to the great powers is to do what I spend a lot of my time trying to do with others and many people who are on this call, trying to persuade them that it is in their common interests to find opportunities to act together against the, you might say the real threats that we live with, which are external to all of our national boundaries and all of these obsessions about security based on weapon systems, which we have, and that we are all subject to. And if we haven't learned that lesson in the last year across the world with the pandemic, we are never going to learn it. You know, a, a relatively small, minuscule, invisible, virus, you know, brought all of our countries almost to their knees and showed that our way of living had no resilience and no resistance to it. And that we're living too much in the short term and not enough, particularly in the future. And I'm really pleased to see so many young people on this discussion because it's the world that they're going to inherit from us that we have to make sustainable. So there is the beginning, I think, in conversations that are taking place reluctantly between leaders of great powers, that they have to commit themselves to a view of the world which addresses these issues of common interest and is sustainable. Um, so I think that's the beginning of the conversation. I think secondly, they probably know all this stuff that Steve knows, but they just haven't packaged it together and worked it through and they need to be helped to do that. And I think finally, because we're in a European Leadership Network context here, Europe has also always been a place that could take leadership in this for this reason, that on every issue, Europe thinks everything. Europe is diverse, completely diverse. And if Europe can find common interests in this space, you know, then we can, I think, lead the rest of the world to begin to find out. And, and Europe needs to play to its strengths you know, it needs, to, it needs to come together in a way that accommodates all of this diversity and moves forward. We cannot possibly depend for, you know, they live in a world where one half of the population of the world, particularly the northern part of it, you know, only sleeps safe in its bed at night because it threatens each other with weapons of mass destruction. That is bound to fail someday. And we need to get away from it. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Des. A uh, very difficult question, Elizabeth. That's all I can say. But let's start looking at positive peace and we'll start looking through an economic lens because we look at most, uh, well, if we look at all the major powers, the, one of the things they strive for is more economic success. The more economic success they've got, the more they're able to uh, 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 export their values and their ideas shall we say. So if we look at positive peace, countries which are improving in positive peace compared to countries which are deteriorating on average have three times higher per capita income per annum. We find that countries which are higher in positive peace compared to countries which are lower in positive peace, same thing applies for ones improving and deteriorating. Interest rates are much lower as our inflation rates. In fact, inflation is seven times less volatile. Countries which are improving in positive peace compared to countries which are deteriorating, they're a, a, a 
the currencies increase to about 1.3% per annum compared to countries which are deteriorating, where they fall. Foreign direct investments twice as high in countries which are improving compared to countries which are deteriorating. If you took countries which are improving in the global peace index and you put the, the stock the indexes for the stock exchanges in those countries compared to the global average of the last 12 years, you would have got 34% higher return. So the economic argument on its own is highly, highly persuasive. But over and above that, most the thing which most governments fear the most, and this is why most governments end up repressing, is they fear political instability and all the things which go with it. And what we can see with positive peace, it creates an environment where you've got higher levels of political instability. So if we look at the concept of resilience, and adaptability fits in here, but we just work off resilience. So countries which are high in positive peace, never haven't had a genocide in the last 30 years, which we've followed it. They have a, a very, very few a, 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 a levels of high levels of political instability compared to countries with low levels of positive peace and even violent demonstrations and such are less. Find countries which are high in positive peace compared to countries which are low in peace have less violent demonstration, have, have less civil resistance movements, they last for a shorter amount of time, they're more moderate in their aim, they're more likely to achieve their aims and are far, far, far less violent. And this is a measure of adaptability. And if we move forward into the future, adaptability is incredibly important. The other thing which comes out of positive peace is the concept of systems. And if we get into that, it's really quite complex and it's, prof it's a profoundly different view the way we've been operating the world for the last 300 years. But if we look at the major challenges facing humanity today, they're global in nature. So things like climate change, ever decreasing biodiversity, full use of the fresh water on the planet. Unless we have a world which is basically peaceful, we'll never get the levels of crust, cooperation, and inclusiveness to solve these problems. But all of these problems are systemic in nature. And right at the heart of positive peace, it's designed around systems thinking. So what it does, it means you come into line, you've get now aligned the way we run our social systems and our governments with systems which align then much better with ecological systems. So what does the role Europe have to play in all this? So Europe is the most peaceful region of the world. So we went to the Global Peace Index, eight of the 10, most peaceful nations in the world uh, reside in Europe this year. That's more than at any other time. Now, also, we'll find you get the highest levels of positive peace in Western Europe as well. So there's a lot of qualities there which Europe can pull on. But I think, so on the negative side, I think Europe needs to take a very careful look at itself because these levels of positive peace being achieved historically. And what we find now is that the levels of the uh, positive peace in many countries in Europe are decreasing. So the kind of things which we can find which are on the decrease are things like group grievances, the quality of information, the uh, quality of political democracies, the fractionalization of elites, uh, working the, the working class, the working conditions and wages and eroding. And so all these things are background conditions. So if we look over the last decade, uh, what we can see is a 251% increase in violent demonstrations. And this COVID didn't settle it down. And so these, and these demonstrations are for a myriad of different reasons. But Western Europe is one of the areas where you get most of the, where you've got one of the areas where you've got most demonstrations. Part of that is because it's a democracy, but although Europe can take the leadership, it does have to look at itself to better understand what it can do to become stronger. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. I, I want to pivot now um, to a question about the next generation. Um, the the idea of turning um, the young, the younger uh, parts of the European Leadership Network and 
um, younger people globally into peace ambassadors may uh, be that wedge to help us um, take positive peace, uh, both from an economic and a social standpoint um, to improve conditions. So my question, um, in conversations with you both and throughout the book, Steve, you've emphasized the importance of building trust for collaboration in order to advance dialogue and achieve positive outcomes. We're witnessing Gen Z and younger millennials empowered by social media boldly challenge intersected injustices in ways that reflect the goals of positive peace, acceptance of the rights of others, tackling water and ecological issues, as you just mentioned, addressing gun violence, and the list goes on and on. Interestingly, though, I doubt many of these activists, advocates, and movement makers would consider themselves security experts. How can the security field make space for and actively engage this cohort of change makers? And again, Des, I'll start with you. I, mean, I think I think they're going to have to. I think that's you know these voices are not going to be stilled in this world that we live in, um, and you know they're a function of uh, of the way in which the world is changing. You know we live in an age where we are all interconnected to an unprecedented degree. You know I mean people of my age have been saying for decades that we are all in, we're all in this together. But now we are all in this together because, you know, we have this, I, I don't want to constantly go back to the pandemic, but we have this very recent experience of where we've all been on the same side of a manifestation, you know, of a low probability, but extraordinarily high impact event, um, which, which we knew was coming, but we didn't properly prepare for together. Um, and, and that has driven us even more into the interconnected environment that we're in today, in which all of these young people live. You know, and they are, I think, in my experience, because I spend as much time as I can talking to young people about these things, they are bamboozled, many of them, by the divisions that we bring into this discussion, which no longer mean anything to them. You know, my own children, who are now in their 30s, when I congratulate them and probably myself really through them as to the way in which they live their lives. They just laugh at me. They say that, I mean, this is how we live. You know, I mean, would you stop, you know, making a big fuss about it? This is who we are. You know, we live in environments, work environments in which there are 20 or 30 nationalities. We have less interest in you and people's individual sexuality. You know, we are less, we, you know, we, 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 we treat everybody in, in a much better way, to be honest, you know, we have much more respect. And I think they're, they're imposing on us increasingly what I call a, a justice narrative. You can see this very strongly in the climate change movement. This is a justice narrative. There is a strong justice narrative in the, in the international climate change movement that is making people sit up and take notice. You know, and demographics will affect this. So no matter what area of public policy you're in, and there is a, there is in the area in, in public policy now this really interesting connection. There is no field of public policy in which science and technology is not important, and mostly it's about data, the stuff that Steve masters. And this data is driving people to start thinking in, in particular ways. We all have limited resources, and there's enormous competition for them. You know, if we all live up to the sorts of commitments we were about to make in Glasgow as a world in COP26 about the amount of money we're going to spend on the challenges of climate change, we'll have very little money for anything else. So we're going to have to make big decisions about what we do, and we're going to be forced, I think, by young people and their views and their concepts of justice into making these sorts of just uh, judgments. The question is whether you know, we can identify in those people, people with the moral leadership standards to emerge quickly enough to save us from what is happening at the moment. Because the resistance to this movement in many of our countries is producing leaders that are not up to this task. And it's leadership that we need. 
But I think there is an inevitability about this. I have a few rules of inevitability in the public field. There are certain things, you know, I mean, if you're, the scandal that you generate in public life is on the front pages for three days, you're gone. It's inevitable, you know. There are a few rules of inevitability, and this is inevitable. And I think young people need to realize the power they have. They need to come together as they do in the YGLN, as they come in other groups that I'm involved in, and they need to start exercising that power. They need to make it clear. They need to write about it. They need to talk about it. They need to engage. And they need to confound these divisions that they're inheriting from older, the older generation. They are the future. And reluctantly, I see Martin Rees on this call. Reluctantly, and he was partly responsible for this. Reluctantly, in our parliament, there is a growing movement about future generation policy. Policy that, that respects the well-being of future generations. Scream at us about this, and we will not do the sorts of things that have caused these problems. Steve, over to you. Right, okay, so we started uh, looking, how do we get the young generation interested in security? And I'll come back to your thought later, Elizabeth. We've got to change the branding. Security is not something they'll get interested in. Security is a word quite often associated, it's a fearful word, quite often associated with fear. Peace is not. Peace is an expansive word. It's a word which she, Braces a whole different genre. It's a word associated with compassion. It's about caring for others. And as Jess explained eloquently, a large part, particularly the educated part, the young generation aware, 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 aware in, in, in that mode. Things like a, a conscious capital. Uh, who would have the, uh, ever thought of that term a decade ago? Well, yeah, it's, in these days, it's, it, it's a driver. We look at com concepts like ESG, and we can see that you get superior investment returns out of voting, out of investing ethically. And part of that is really is that the companies themselves who embrace ESG, companies which are looking forward into the future, they're trying to look over the horizon of the next couple of reporting periods laying the groundwork for a company which should be viable in the long term. I think to a large extent that's why it works. So now for me, one of the things we do ahead of the Institute for Economics and Peace is we've got these short courses to create IMP ambassadors, okay? And it's all basically the training is around our work in positive peace. We've also created an online training course called Positive Peace Academy. And so, we've, and so we've got about 3,000 ambassadors we've trained. We've just finished training a, a four, four or 500 people in Ethiopia. That was the last set we've done. And so we've got a lot of people who are now picking up on the, uh, the uh, Positive Peace Academy and training on that. But we need to shift our visions and visions further. So quite often when we're talking, it'll be everyone on this call, we're talking to the elite. So we're only talking to people who are university educated. And all the values which Des expressed earlier on have, have reflected in all that. So if you looked at the top of 20% in education and income, when you went back 60 years ago, they all voted to the right. Those people all now vote to the left. So whether they were in the UK, they were conservative, voting conservatives, well, most of them, and particularly the young ones, voting Labor, same in Australia, and that's a trend globally. But what it says is now the working class people, okay, have shifted away from the traditional working class parties, and we can see this reflected particularly in your country, in the US, and we can see it expressed in Brit Exit as well, uh, voting a, a, a for the, a, a, the countries of the right. And there's a paradoxical problem in that, which is coming up into the future, because the classes which represent the most wealthy, although they'll have the rhetoric appeal to these people, they're not going to be able to satisfy their needs and their wants. And that's going to create more radical outcomes, I think, in politics into the future. So when we're talking about sort of how do we include the young, we've got to think beyond just the educated young. Somehow we've got to get to working class people and bring them on board. So I was speaking with someone in the States this morning and sort of it's a fact we've all seen and heard of a lot lately. And I think it's probably over-exaggerated, but I'll repeat it. 
uh, is that 70% of people who voted Republican in the last election still believe the election was stolen. So, it's, it, so if, as we move forward, if we really want to truly create change, we've got to embrace what of the, particularly the working class, they've got to be able to see a future. Now, if we looked in positive peace, there are two of the eight pillars which have performed poorly over the last decade. First one's low levels of corruption. It's actually deteriorated globally, okay, including all the Western democracies. And remember, it's a perception index. It's all, so it's based around the perceptions, which you can't actually really measure it directly. The second is well-functioning government. It's only just improved, whereas all the other pillars have improved quite strongly over the last decade. So I think this is things which should, part of this comes back the sort of the large part of the working class aren't actually in the debate anymore. Thank you for that. Um, so we need to look um, beyond just age to the other socioeconomic uh, factors that may be creating these divisions. Um, I want to uh, conclude the recorded portion of our discussion and open the floor. Um, I thank you both, Deb.